amidst all the very lovely comments on our Elden Ring April Fool parody song. Thanks for those, by the way. You sure know how to make a cartoon boy blush. We also saw that a bunch of you wanted our legitimate takes on the game that took over the discourse for the last few months. So, this one's for you. Do you really wanna, do you really wanna grace there? I'm kidding, I'm kidding. No more songs. This is an actual episode. Let's go. As a designer, tarnished or otherwise, when you look at a game, it's your job to figure out why other designers made the decisions that they did. You know, kind of like looking at bloodstained specters in a Soulsborne game to learn from past experiences. And since I've been absolutely enamored with getting lost in the lands between ever since Elden Ring was released, I wanted to take a look at some of its oddest design choices and see what they can tell us about what problems From Software was trying to solve in their latest game. So you know what that means. It's List Voice time! This episode was made possible by the brand new Nebula classes, which I am super pumped to tell you about after the episode, cause I made one. Number one, Shields Overriding Weapons Ashes of War. Ashes of War are an awesome addition to the weapons of the Souls family of games, but they don't work on your weapon if you're holding a shield. Unless of course we are talking about the hilarious named No Skill Ash of War, whose title just tells us all we need to know about what the devs think about you using it. So why would they do this? Why go to all of the trouble of making a whole system to allow the player to socket special attacks, each of which having to be individually built into their weapons, if they're just going to tell the player that they can't use them if they're using a shield? Well, possibly because they want players to move away from the old sword and board, I sit behind a big shield all day, style of play. If we look at Bloodborne, we can see that they've already experimented with this. And with Sekiro, they take another pass at it, introducing stealth and trying it from another vector. But by Elden Ring, they're confident enough to let you go back to the days of turtling up, but they're also building in pretty big incentives for you not to. I.e., the coolest weapon skills require you not to. But then what made Sword and Board something they wanted to discourage? Well, if I had to guess, it might be because that style of play fell into the center of the game design cardinal sin Venn diagram. It created a suboptimal play experience, but was also way too good for players not to use. In fact, I'd be willing to gamble a fair bit that they think it's more engaging to go in without a shield up all the time, but that their metrics told them that the majority of players in Dark Souls games choose this exact style of play. Hence why they might have been trying to discourage it ever since. Number two, summons and ashes of war costing FP. So what problem were they trying to solve by putting systems in the game that requires everyone from the biggest claymore-wielding barbarian to the stealthiest of rogues to the most magic-flinging wizards to have to have the game's equivalent of mana to use? I mean, when you first look at this choice, it does seem odd. Why would you make melee characters have to invest in a magic stat? Doesn't that give caster characters an advantage by making it easier for them to access the strongest summons since they already invest in extra FP? When you look a little closer though, this one is actually pretty straightforward. They wanted to diversify builds and give players more interesting choices when they leveled up, which is a great goal in and of itself, but it also becomes essential in a game of this size. To begin with, melee builds in Dark Souls really never presented the most interesting leveling choices. You cared about vitality, endurance, and your most relevant melee stat. So 90% of the time, when you leveled up, you just immediately throw a point into one of those and move on. But by pulling you in another direction and giving you another stat to care about, especially in the early game, it makes every level a much more intriguing and agonizing choice to make. But this becomes doubly important when you think about the scope of Elden Ring as compared to their previous games. In the other Souls games, the player usually finishes their first run with their level in the 50s or 60s. But Elden Ring is gigantic. I wouldn't be surprised if it was more likely for the average player to finish a run of Elden Ring closer to the 120s, which means they're going to hit these soft caps much sooner and would basically hard cap most of the stats they cared about by the time they're done, which really isn't interesting and doesn't make for a compelling leveling experience. Hence the decision that FP wasn't just for mages anymore. Number three, summons themselves. For the first time in a Souls game, we have at will non-player summons, which by the way, I absolutely love, but then what problem were they trying to solve with this addition? After all, the previous games turned out great without them. Well, here it kind of looks more like a strategic decision. I think they're trying to expand the Souls audience with Elden Ring and bring in new players who have maybe never played a From Software game before. And they don't want to lower the difficulty of the bosses and anger their existing fan base, but they also want to give new players something to make the game a little more approachable without them having to go through the haphazard and often frustrating process of summoning other players. Which dovetails us nicely right into... Number 4. Tuning the bosses for multiplayer. Now, here I could be mistaken. 
but it really feels like most of the bosses in Elden Ring are really designed for a multiplayer experience. And they kind of have to be if From Software is going to give every player the option of playing pseudo multiplayer with summons whenever they want. So why go in this direction? Well, I think the reason here is really twofold. First, the designers have very little idea what summons each player will have access to at any given point in the game, so the safest bet is to just tune the bosses with the assumption that the players will have a human-ish level ally. Second, the bosses are tuned this way because they want to encourage cooperative multiplayer. Playing with other people on your team makes the game instantly feel less harsh and off-putting. And for players new to Souls games, feeling like they're being given permission to bring in people to help them with the bosses, rather than the old get good attitude that developed around some of their other titles, does make it an experience they're less likely to bounce off of. Not to mention, hopefully as they play with more experienced players, maybe they'll also pick up on some of the old tried and true Souls boss fighting techniques for themselves. Number 5. Player messages looking like items. Okay, this one's a bit of a cop-out because I actually have no idea why you'd ever do this to me from soft devs. I mean, we have enough ways to grief people in a Souls game without other players leading me astray or into ambushes by putting messages just barely, barely behind boxes or on faraway ledges like that one. Like, I'm gonna go over there right now. I'm gonna do it because I have to. I have to get all the shinies and it's right over there. So here I go. I'm gonna walk. It's probably not even gonna be a mushroom. Why do they have to be so similar? <laughs> Now, I found as I lived, died, and learned in Elden Ring, it made me think a little bit about my actual life choices, you know? And because I was feeling particularly reflective about my journey as of late, I decided to capture it all on film over at Nebula Classes. Nebula Classes is a brand new part of Nebula, our creator-owned streaming platform we've been building with a ton of our other creator friends like Jordan Harrod and Tirzu. And in my talk, How to Be Ready for Your Dream Job, I get to go over a ton of things I wish I knew earlier in my career in the hopes that anyone starting out in the entertainment industry can leverage that info and won't have to make the same boneheaded mistakes that I made. The class is fully produced by me and the Nebula team, and I am just so extremely proud of how it turned out, I can't wait for you to see it. In fact, I had so much fun that when I told Jeff about it, he decided he wanted to make a class on the best practices for video game design and production, which is going to come out in a few months. Though it's not just us. We've recently launched with classes from Amy Nolte, Thomas Frank, Sam from Wendover, Devin from Legal Legal, and more, including exclusive classes from the team over at Bright Trip. And the coolest part is, new classes drop every week, led by your favorite creators and experts in their field. Plus, since Classes is part of Nebula, you'll also get access to all of the exclusive and ad-free content from Nebula creators, as well as some awesome originals like Battle of Britain from Real Engineering and Modern Conflicts from Real Life Lore. Oh, and you can watch these and over 10,000 other videos just about anywhere with our iPhone, iPad, Android, Android TV, Apple TV, and Roku apps. And all of what I just talked about is just $10 per month or $100 per year. But if you visit our link below, you can sign up for the discounted price of just eight bucks per month or 80 bucks per year. And if you're already a Nebula subscriber, thanks for that, by the way, upgrading to classes is just an extra five bucks a month. That's a lot of learning at a little price. Oh, I didn't see you there, Kyle Murgatroyd, Joseph Blaine, Dominic Valenciana, Casey Muscha, Arclight Games, Angelo Valenciana, Alicia Bramble, and Ahmed Ziad Turk. Y'all are the best.